Israel had turned the canal's east bank into the most formidable defensive barrier in the world. They called it the Bar Lev Line, and part of it still stands today. The front of the line was a 70-foot high wall of sand studded with heavily armed strongholds. Even if an Egyptian force managed to cross the canal through heavy gunfire, the IDF calculated that it would take them hours to blast holes through the sand wall, giving Israel ample time to send reinforcements to the front. Clearly, attacking the Bar Lev line was suicide, but on October 6, 1973, Egypt launched just such an attack. It was a great night. The evening, uh, about after midnight with 30 minutes, we met all the commanders, shake hands, kissed each other, and we gave a, a holy swear that we will do all our best to win because we have no choice. We have to win or to die, nothing else. The attack began at 1400 hours. Egypt pounded the entire length of the Bar Lev line with every weapon available. As Egyptian bombers blasted communications positions, 4,000 guns rained shells down on the Bar Lev strongholds in a 20-minute barrage. Israel's air force flew to the rescue only to be met by surface-to-air missiles. At 1420, Egyptian troops carried a thousand assault rafts to the banks of the Suez. Rangers had already slipped across and sabotaged the Bar Lev line's ultimate defense against attackers, a pipeline of oil that was to be poured into the canal and set aflame. The first wave of attackers carried anti-tank weapons, bridge-laying equipment, and high-pressure water pumps. The water pumps were the ingenious solution to the problem of the 70-foot sand barrier. Israel thought it would take at least 12 hours to penetrate the barrier using explosives, but by simply using water to wear down the sand, Egypt broke through in less than three. The water hoses opened large gaps in the sand barrier. Then some of our forces unfolded bridges into the water and took them from the west side to the east side in order to connect them with the bridgehead that was just opened. Then bulldozers proceeded to flatten a road so the rest of our forces could cross from the bridges. Some soldiers used wooden ladders to climb over the huge sand barrier in the areas that did not get opened by the hoses. I was a major commanding a unit. I carried my weapons, which were a rifle and a pistol, as well as lots of ammunition and lots of supplies and water, plus anything else that would facilitate my mission. All of that would have weighed about 40 kilograms. The crossing was marked by very high morale. It was also marked by the cry, God is great. Israel had built 33 fortified outposts along the Bar Lev line, each about six miles apart. Only 16 were operational on the day of the attack. The 600 soldiers manning the fortresses were stunned by the sight of tens of thousands of Egyptian troops swarming toward them. The first stronghold fell less than an hour after the attack began, and the rest began to follow in a domino effect. For the IDF, it was almost inconceivable. Arab soldiers, never considered worthy opponents, had taken them by surprise. When you are ready for war, and all the arrangements are finished, you will feel like students who finished all his studies and ready for the exam next day. It has been for us a great pleasure to share in that war, because we know exactly who are the Israeli troops and who are the Israeli commanders. We have been looking to them from the war of 67 in front of us till the day of the 6th of October. We know their capacity. We know what they can do. And we know what we can do. And that land was ours. 
Israel's second line units, posted some 10 miles behind the Barlev line, went into action. Tanks were sent to the front without infantry or air support, breaking one of the cardinal rules of armored warfare. They paid the price. Charging IDF tanks were ambushed by Egyptian soldiers carrying wire-guided Sagar missiles and handheld RPG-7s. IDF losses were heavy. A crucial advance in technology had given Egyptian foot soldiers the edge over the IDF Armored Corps, which was far better at fighting other tanks than men lying in ambush. By the end of October 6th, Egypt had overrun the Barlev line. 14 Israeli strongholds had been captured. Five bridges and 10 decoys now linked the east and west banks of the Suez Canal. Five infantry divisions, roughly 80,000 men, had crossed over to the Sinai with 208 killed, a death toll much lower than the Egyptians had expected. Behind the front lines, Israel's general staff was in a state of near panic. Reserve units were being hastily mustered together, and battalions in the rear were rushed to the front. Many senior commanders refused to accept the severity of the situation. They simply could not believe that Egypt was capable of launching a successful attack. The men who went to the front discovered the truth. The worst thing I experienced was our division's deputy commander telling me, Asaf Yaguri, your battalion is the first battalion to reach the canal out of the reserve battalions. Today, we have got four working tanks between the Suez Canal and Tel Aviv. This means that on the northern axis, there are no armored forces but yours. Then, I met a group of four armored men standing in tank hatches blackened by soot, embarrassed and beaten. And what they said to me was, we are refugees from the strongholds. God save your souls in the hell you are going to. Of course, with the beginning of the war, there was total destruction in more than one location. And a lot of people were destroyed and died. But I keep saying that the noble cause is to liberate my land. This will make anything worth sacrificing. <laughs> 